Good morning, Gardens. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Lord, and who is present in this place through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that calls us to worship this morning, so would you join with me in the call to worship that you'll see on the screens and also in your bulletins. The Lord be with you. Jesus is the Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, it's great to see everyone this morning as we gather together in the name of Jesus. Just a quick reminder and a quick announcement that we have um, the friendship pads on the edge of each of the rows. We want members and guests and visitors alike to sign those. Welcome to all of our guests and visitors this morning. Pray that you'd experience the presence of Jesus Christ as we gather together and through the friendship and the fellowship of this congregation. One of the things that is great about being the church is that we are called not just to hang out together on Sunday mornings in this space and in this room, but that we are called to be a people who go out into the world and to love and to bless and to serve others because of our faith in Jesus. And one of the ways that we do that as a congregation is through our mission partners. And we have a variety of mission partners. And as you know, sometimes we have a chance to highlight particular mission partners. This morning we are pleased to be able to highlight our mission partnership with Habitat for Humanity and I would welcome the CEO of Habitat for Humanity, Bernie Godek, to come forward who's going to share with us some information about Habitat for Humanity here in the Palm Beaches. Thank you. Good morning. First I would like to uh, Thank you for inviting me to come down this morning and share with you what Habitat for Humanity is all about, what we do, and especially what we do here in Palm Beach County. Now, I warned Tom I could talk for an hour on Habitat for Humanity, so he gave me five minutes. So I'm going to uh, rush through my, you got to see a PowerPoint, of course. So I'm going to rush through the PowerPoint because I really want to get to the last slide. The last slide is really a good summary of why we do what we do. Next slide, please. We help families build strength, stability, and self-reliance through shelter. Okay, our mission statement. Habitat used to have a mission statement that was about two paragraphs long. Nobody could remember it. So they finally said, really, what is our mission? And I love the mission statement. Seeking to put God's love into action. Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, community, and hope. We're a nonprofit organization of 501c3 Christian Housing Ministry. We build decent and affordable homes. And I'm not going to go through and read all these to you, but the, the population that we serve are very low and low-income families, and that's established by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And again, we're a volunteer-based organization. I don't think we would be out speaking to groups like yours, uh, corporations, private individuals, unless we needed volunteers to help us um, really fulfill our mission. And again, partnerships are key to us. Next slide. Some of our core principles. Probably the most important one is the first one. We demonstrate our faith through our hands. Not just on Sunday, not just on Saturday. We do it every day of the week, and we do it using our hands and, of course, our hearts. Our focus is purely home ownership. We don't do any rental at all. We truly believe in the benefits of home ownership and what that does for families. We're advocates for affordable housing. We advocate here at the local level, state level, and at the federal level. And again, we want to be able to change families' lives and make that sustainable and change communities and make that sustainable. And I'll give one quick example. Probably one of the most economically depressed areas of the city of West Palm Beach is in the North Tamarin area. Some of you may know the name Coleman Park. Well, we've been working hand in hand with the city of West Palm Beach in redeveloping Coleman Park. To talk about the change in that community, when we started building there about three and a half, four years ago, our homes were appraising based on comps in the area at about $72,000. Our most recent appraisal, a month ago, again based on comps in the area, came in at 163,000. That is significant change. Next slide. 
A little bit of history about Habitat. Habitat for Humanity International uh, was started back in 1976 in a small southern Georgia town called Americus, right next to Plains, Georgia. And a lot of people think, well, that's why Jimmy Carter started Habitat. Well, he didn't. He's one of our biggest advocates, but it was a couple, Millard and Linda Fuller, that started the affiliate in Americus, Georgia back in 1976. We started here in Palm Beach County in 1986, and I just want to highlight some of the accomplishments. 231 homes as of today we've either built new or rehabbed here in Palm Beach County. Our first major project was a 14-home community in the Westgate area of City of West Palm Beach, and those were 14 homes. Then we decided to test ourselves, and we took on a project that Palm Beach County gave us, and that was the development of a 27-home project up in Jupiter called Kennedy Estates One. The county owned the property. All the infrastructure was in. The only thing somebody needed to do was come in and build homes for low-income families, and nobody would step up to the plate. So we did. I wasn't sure if we were ready to do it, but we took it on. And we finished that project right in the middle of the Great Recession. We were only six months past what we said we were going to do to complete that community. So that was, a, that was quite a milestone for us. Then we joined, became a partner with the Lake Worth Community Redevelopment Agency during the Great Recession. They received $23 million from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to rehabilitate the downtown residential area of the city of Lake Worth. They asked us to be a partner, and as a result of that, we built 46 brand new homes down in the residential area, downtown area. Then we took on another project up in Jupiter, which was Kennedy Estates II. That was a 19-home community. We became a home preservation affiliate or a neighborhood revitalization affiliate where we actually go out and repair homes of owner-occupied homes. Now, these aren't owned by Habitat families. Many of the families that we provide home preservation services for are older individuals, individuals with physical needs, it's amazing how many people in the downtown uh, West Palm Beach area are living without air conditioning at works. Some haven't had hot water because the hot water tank broke two years ago. So they'll come forward to us, ask us to make those repairs, quality of life repairs, and we'll do that. And it's not free. They will pay back a percentage to us of the value of the work that we do. Anywhere from 10% to 60% of the value of the work. And then we use that payback to keep funding our repair uh, program. And we were honored in 2017 by Nonprofits First as the best large nonprofit uh, organization in Palm Beach County. And that was quite an honor for us. Next slide. Jonathan Reckford, who's our international CEO, will tell you that Habitat for Humanity is the most complex nonprofit organization you can work for. And he's absolutely right. You look at how we're organized. We do have a board of directors, all volunteers. We do family selection. We provide family services. We build homes. We're a construction company. We do outreach for volunteers. We fundraise. We're a fund development organization. We run three retail operations to help support our operational expenses. We're a finance and mortgage company, which a lot of people don't realize. We administer our own Habitat mortgages to our families. Of course, we do neighborhood revitalization, and we have about seven advisory committees made up of volunteers that help us and guide us in our mission. Next slide. I don't think we need to talk much about the need in Palm Beach County. These statistics come from the county itself. A decent two-bedroom, one-bath apartment right now, the average cost is $1,900 a month. About 80% of the residents in Palm Beach County cannot afford that. Most families are paying more than 50% of their monthly income on housing, and that's just unacceptable. They will tell you, the county commissioners will tell you that the number one issue facing Palm Beach County right now is decent, affordable housing, both rental and home ownership. And of course, the recession that happened, uh, well, many years ago, really didn't help us at all. People were asking us, why aren't you buying up foreclosed homes? Well, many of the homes that were foreclosed were 2,200 square feet, 3,000 square feet. Our families could not afford that. So it really wasn't any assistance to Habitat. Next slide. 
Talk about our families. Who are our Habitat families? First of all, they're first-time home buyers, which means they hadn't have owned a home in the past three years. And there's got to be a need for housing. During the recession, we had some people call us up that lived in gated communities and said, we'd like to downsize. Can we have a Habitat home? Well, there was no need. They lived in a decent home already. Uh, we income qualify. They have to have a stable income. They fall within 30% to 80% of the area median income. And very quickly, that means very low and low income families. They've got to have a credit score of 580, though that's not a deal breaker, because many of our families come to us, they don't have a credit score. They've never dealt with credit, only cash. And of course, a willingness to partner. You know, we say it's, it's not a handout, it's a hand up. Our families, once they decide to partner with us, make a really, really tough commitment. One is they're going to do 400 hours of volunteer time, which we call sweat equity. Now, a portion of that is going to be spent in a classroom learning how to be a homeowner. They go through eight weeks of very intensive homeownership preparation classes, which includes a successful completion of Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Then they spend the remainder of that time building their home. If their home is not ready to be built, they'll build another Habitat family's home until theirs is ready to go. And of course, they've got to agree to pay back a 30-year interest-free mortgage with Habitat. Uh, just to give you an idea, in the Coleman Park area, now those monthly mortgage payments are going to vary depending upon where we're building. In the downtown West Palm Beach area, the mortgage payments for our families are averaging between $600 and $650 a month. Brand new home, four bedroom, two bath, three bedroom, two bath. That's for principal, taxes, and insurance, all in. Very affordable. Okay, next slide. What do we build? I mean, you can read through that. Uh, I'll highlight just a couple things. Uh, we build everything from a two bedroom, one bath, everything, all the way up to a five bedroom, three bath. All uh, concrete block construction. We used to do wood frame and we've moved away from that. We only build one wood frame home a year. And that's the one that's built by the Construction Academy at Seminole Ridge High School. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. But they actually have a construction lab that is so big, they literally build a Habitat home in that lab and then ship it to a home site that we prepared. That's all wood frame, but that's the only one. Again, volunteer labor. It costs us right now about $150,000 to build a home, 30-year uh, interest-free mortgage, and it's funded through gifts, donations, grants, uh, and I'll go into a little bit more of that in the next slide. So how do we do it? We go out and talk to individuals, we talk to groups, we talk to different congregations, corporations, and we tell them about our mission and the life-changing effect that Habitat has on families. It truly is life-changing for them. Uh, we do it through fundraising events, though we don't hold many of those. There's so many fundraising events in Palm Beach County, especially during season, that uh, we've decided, you know what, we'll do two major events a year, and that's it. One is a gala, which we have coming up November 2nd at the Breakers, and then we have a golf event in the spring, and that's it. Uh, we recycle the principal portion of our mortgage payments to build, so we recycle that money. We do it through the sale of mortgages. Many banks love buying Habitat mortgages. The reason being is because if one becomes non-performing, the bank gives us that mortgage back and we substitute another performing mortgage for it. Plus they get community redevelopment, uh, they get CRA credits, and I forget what CRA stands for. But those are mandated by the federal government. They must reinvest so much money back into the communities where the banks are. We do it through our retail operations. Last year, our retail operations brought in just under $2.9 million. Next slide. Your passion is, <laughs> okay. is contagious. I'm almost, we're going to move to the that last slide. We are on board. This is exciting stuff. I'm sorry. I guess I could talk for now. Let's go ahead and keep going through the slides, and we'll get to the last one. We depend upon volunteers. Habitat in the Glades, that's our future. Next slide. That's a home we built in Pahokee. We've only built three in the past 32 years. It's an embarrassment. That is a groundbreaking ceremony. We celebrate everything. And the last slide. That picture was taken unbeknownst to them. That's up in Jupiter. They were taking a lunch break, and that couple, that family, stood back and looked at their home being built. They were just working on it, so we captured that picture. 
And I'll end it with this. The best analogy I use to describe habitat is a ladder. A ladder provides a framework by which you can get from a lower level to a higher level. You can stand on that lower step and not get anywhere if you don't put effort behind it. And that's what we provide a framework and an opportunity for families themselves to improve. It's their decision to take the next step, and the next step, and the next step. And I'm sorry for going over. I'll end it there. Far be it from me. <laughs> this congregation knows far be it for me to throw stones about going too long. So it's, I'm just, I'm jealous. You do, no, it's all right. I, I'm going to have to keep it short today. Well, um, just a, one more thing to, to hear about the way that we as a congregation have a chance to partner with Habitat for Humanity. I invite Kathy Williams to come forward and, and share a little bit about what that looks like for us. I promise I'll be three minutes. In Cape May, in our Presbyterian church, one of our fundraisers was to buy a stud. So the construction people are going to bring us 10 studs sometime this week. And they're $50 a stud. You can split it any way you would like. And we would like the congregation to draw pictures, write a Bible verse, a poem, anything to wish them luck in their new home. And then the studs will be installed on September 26th. And enough people would like to come and see their studs as they're put up in the house. And we'll provide some donuts and refreshments because the, the developer would like to video our donation because we're the first people down here to do this. So there will be more forthcoming when the studs get delivered. Thanks, Captain. Lots of good stuff to hear about how we can be involved in being about the work of, of seeing the reign of God come here in the Palm Beaches. I want to invite you all now to stand and to greet one another and welcome each other to worship this morning. Thanks. Part of the morning where you need to call and cancel whatever plans you had for this afternoon. Because my manuscript, this, my sermon, it was like six pages, single space, ten point font. So, you know, settle in. We're going to be here for a while. No, that's all right. We'll give you the highlights. We'll, we'll try to hit the highlights of, uh, of this particular passage of Scripture. Just to give you some context, set the context where we've been, where we are. This is, maybe, uh, there may be a, a great sigh of relief or some, a standing ovation, but this is the last uh, sermon in our summer sermon series of Prophet and Kings. We'll be done with uh, the books of 1st, 2nd Samuel, and now this morning in 1st Kings. We've dealt with a lot of heavy stuff this summer as we have kind of traced and stepped into some of these Old Testament stories about Israel, about Israel's covenantal leaders, about their faithlessness, and about God's presence in their life. What we'll come to see here in just a few moments as we read this passage from 1 Kings, we've now transitioned out of the book of 2 Samuel into 1 Kings, which is another historical book that, uh, that kind of relates uh, Old Testament Israel's history and their kind of the, the, their nation, the nation building, and their, their reign, the different reigns of kings and prophets. David, as you will see, is now dead. His son Solomon it will be the one who su succeeds him as king. And we'll see, uh, we'll be introduced to Solomon. And in the particular passage of Scripture, starting in 1 Kings 3, we'll have a chance to, to... It's a passage of Scripture that highlights, kind of foreshadows, gives us a taste of who Solomon is and what Solomon's reign is about. Did I say Samuel? I meant to say Solomon. I don't even remember what I'm saying. Solomon. He's the son of David who's going to be the next king. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then David lay down with his ancestors and was buried in David's city. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven years in Hebron and 30 years, 33 years in Jerusalem. Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his royal power was well established. Now Solomon loved the Lord by walking in the laws of his father David, with the exception that he also sacrificed and burned incense at the shrines. The king went to the great shrine at Gibeon and ordered a sacrifice there. He used to offer a thousand entirely burned offerings on that altar. 
The Lord appeared to Solomon at Gibeon in a dream at night. And God said, ask whatever you wish, and I'll give it to you. Solomon responded, you showed so much kindness to your servant, my father David, when he walked before you in truth and righteousness. And with a heart true to you, you've kept this great loyalty and kindness for him and have now given him a son to sit on his throne. And now, Lord, my God, you have made me your servant king in my father David's place. But I'm young and inexperienced. I know next to nothing, but I'm here, your servant in the middle of the people you have chosen, a large population that can't be numbered or counted due to its vast size. Please give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil, because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had made this request. God said to him, because you have asked for this instead of requesting long life or wealth or victory over your enemies, asking for discernment so as to acquire good judgment, I will now do just what you said. Look, I hereby give you a wise and understanding mind. There has been no one like you before now, nor will there be anyone like you afterward. I now also give you what you didn't ask for, wealth and fame. There won't be a king like you as long as you live. And if you walk in my ways and obey my laws and commands, just as your father David did, then I will give you a very long life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we invite your presence in this place. Come in great abundance and speak to us now as we quiet our hearts to hear from you. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, five to seven minutes, here goes, challenge accepted. <laughs> All right, so as I said, 1 Kings 3 sets up all of Solomon's reign. And there are essentially three things that this passage, this brief passage in the book of 1 Kings does. The first thing that it does is it, and it both speaks to Solomon's vices and his virtues. The first thing that it does is it highlights his, I don't know if you want to call it a vice or a virtue or just a reality, his political acumen. Solomon is somebody who will build kind of international partnerships with the neighboring kingdoms and will see not only his personal wealth grow, but will see the wealth, the prestige, and the stature of the kingdom, the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah increase. Solomon becomes somewhat like a flamboyant superstar king. Renowned for his wisdom, people will come to him from even other nations to seek out his wisdom and his advice. And he, not unlike his father or the kings before him, will struggle with sexual faithfulness and adultery as we have seen with some of these other kings. The second thing that we see here that is highlighted in these first opening verses of chapter 3 is that Solomon is someone who will struggle with religious faithfulness. He's someone who might be described as more religious than spiritual, who's more into religious practice that is devoid of any strong connection or, or um, outflow of spiritual fervor within the heart and soul. He is something akin to a, what, we would, what we call sometimes maybe the cultural Christian or somebody whose faith is more cultural than spiritually convicting and will be about religious practice because that's just what is expected. And we see in this particular passage of Scripture that he also tends towards idolatry and to the pagan worship of the nations that surround him. 
as he will worship at their shrines as well. And the final thing that we see of Solomon is that some of those vices, they're virtue. And in particular, as we are introduced to him as king, this highlights two of his greatest virtues, two of the greatest assets that he will bring as king. First and foremost, he demonstrates, at least at this young stage in his young kind of political life, amazing humility. When visited by God and God asks him for the one thing that he would wish and desire, the first thing that Solomon does is not kind of blurt out what it is that, God, that he would desire of God, but he begins to introspectively acknowledge his own inability to be king. He says, I'm not ready for this. This is above my pay grade. What am I doing here? Not only does he, he only, that not only does he acknowledge his inability in some of the ways that he's not ready or prepared for this role, but he also acknowledges the role that God has played in bringing him to this place. He looks back at David, his father's reign, and, the, and he plays the role of theologian and recognizes that essentially the only reason that David was anointed king is because God was sovereign and it was God's will. So all that David achieved was really God working in and through David and his reign. And so by acknowledging God's activity and God's kind of sovereignty and power within his father's reign, he again submits himself before God and says, God, I need you. If I am to be a faithful king, I need you to lead me and to guide me in doing this work. And so he shows enormous, demonstrates enormous humility and submits to the power and the presence of Yahweh God. And then this humility, it's worked out in the request that, God, that he makes of God. And again, instead of wealth, instead of power, instead of anything, the feet of his enemies, he asks for wisdom or for discernment, the ability to lead his people well. The ability to step into challenging decisions. The ability to make the decisions that would see his people shepherded well. Now we'll see, and there's some foreshadowing in this, that there will be times that some of Solomon's this attribute of wisdom and discerning judgment, which is at least requested in this position of, of humility... It can at times and will at times in Solomon's reign be used for his own personal kind of empire building, his own personal brand building. And so some of that kind of selfless humility that we see at this moment will undergo some temptation that Solomon himself will not be able to resist. But at this moment, to Solomon's credit, he demonstrates this humility and he demonstrates wisdom as granted by God. So just allow me a few more minutes to try to sum up where we've been this summer and what the purpose and the point of it all has been. Because <laughs> I'm sure maybe you've been asking that question. I don't really know. Other than the fact that the scriptures, as I've said before, they are, they are our story. It is our spiritual autobiography. It is our spiritual inheritance. We are part of the covenant people that God began and initiated in the covenant God cut with Abraham, with this dynasty that God established with David. The story of the Old Testament, the story of God's covenant people, Israel, it is our spiritual and religious and theological heritage. It is what birthed and out of which came in our belief as Christians was fulfilled in the person and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ as the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the Davidic king who would be the good shepherd who would lay down his life and establish a kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom for God's covenant people that would not end. And we are engrafted. We have entrance into this kingdom. Our passport is stamped by Jesus and because of our faith in Jesus.
But there are some things that I won't lie to you that have kind of nagged at me at me all summer. There's some questions that I still have. Places that have been hard for me to wrestle with all this summer as we've dealt with some of these stories in the Old Testament. And the first thing is that as I look back of where we've been, as I think about what we've seen about who God is and how God has acted in relation to some of these kings, I've come to the realization that there's much about our God that I do not understand. There's much about God that I'm uncomfortable with. There's a lot in these stories that I don't like. And that if I were God, I would have done it differently. (laughs) He says humbly. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm going to resist the temptation to do anything more than just to say that. I don't have answers. I can't put a nice bow on some of these things. The only thing that I can say is it's okay to have questions. It's okay to not have all the answers. It's okay to be troubled by the things that we read in Scripture. And it's okay for those things to keep you up at night. Because that's part of what faith means. To not have the answers and to still hold on to that. The second thing that has been clear to me as I've read through these passages of scriptures as we've talked about them throughout the summer has been the realization that sin is real and it is so, so destructive. When people choose to serve themselves, when people use their lives to pursue selfish ends, that do not acknowledge God and that fail to honor and care for and respect others, people get hurt, they are wounded, and that hurt and wounding will and could last a lifetime in victims. In sin, when it is perpetrated by the church, Within the church, when it is not repented or acknowledged but covered up, as we have seen in so many of these sexual scandals, further serves to discredit the testimony and witness of faith in Jesus Christ and is in the church. And any kind of critique that would be leveled upon the church and its leadership is absolutely justified. But sin ruins lives. It ruins lives. And the final thing that I suppose I have come to realize or have learned through our summer conversations is that, again, human beings are complex. So complex. We saw that last week with David. We see this again with Solomon. It's hard to say, is a person good? Is a person evil? We as human beings are both the divine image bearers. We carry the divine spark. And yet we also are capable of enormous sin and evil and can hurt so many. We are capable of blessing. We are capable of hurt. There is much in our lives that is to be celebrated and that is of God. And there is much that must be forgiven and repented. And that is who we are as human beings. Broken and imperfect. And the thing that amazes me more than anything else is that this is how God has chosen to build God's kingdom. And this is how the reign of God is to come. Through people who are broken like you and me. People who are capable of good and capable of evil. And it means for us as followers of Jesus who take our faith in Jesus seriously, the single most important thing that we can do is to be people who practice confession and repentance. Not so that we beat ourselves up, but so that we acknowledge who we are 
so that we acknowledge what can lie in our hearts and that we make room and space for the Holy Spirit to transform us because it will be our openness, our willingness to repent, to acknowledge our mistake and cling to the grace of Jesus that will pro provide our most profound witness to the reign of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, into this time and into this space, we invite you to come. Amen. I invite you to stand now and join in singing our hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus.